Oh my god, we have to wait a year until final season part two. The walls around me are crumbling in, man. <sighs> That's fine. MAPPA has pretty much proven to everyone, like I said they would, that they're fit for helming AOT, but all of us collectively uh, should probably start rubbing it in the faces of those salty AOT fans, air quotes. That isn't why we're here though. We are here to talk about Attack on Titan final season, episode 16. The events of the episode, like, Peak becoming everyone's new waifu again? Sasha being called a no-no word? Yelena making strange faces to people? And Zeke having visions of a little girl? Don't worry, I got the FBI ready on call at any moment. So with that out of the way, let's give the final episode of Final Season Part 1 an in-depth review. Though please be sure to stick around towards the end as I have some major announcements regarding the future of AOT content on this channel. Let's get into it. Firstly, my boy, my guy, my dude, Levi, where has he gone to? Is he alive? Well, one could simply guess at this point and have a good shot at getting an answer. But for me, I am still 50-50. Erwin Smith literally sacrificed himself and all of the Survey Corps for this guy. That's how much of a badass Levi is. So bearing that in mind, would Levi die to one measly thunder spear? <laughs> well, maybe on direct impact like a noob tube in Call of Duty, but knowing what Levi has gone through and how insane this guy is, I can see him surviving this though gravely injured. But you know, like I said, I'm 50-50 on it because I mean, hey, we still have yet to see him so he very well may be dead. We just have to wait until the next episode or episodes to see the outcome of this. Though I would love to hear your opinion on Levi's state of being in the comments below. As well, the other topics we'll be discussing in today's video, like what the hell happened with Zeke in this episode? On the flip side, is Zeke alive? What? Did he get swallowed by an abnormal titan and the flash of the girl he saw in his mind? Was that just some sort of symbolism or hidden relationship Zeke had that hasn't been shown yet? Well, I think Zeke is 100% alive, because I believe this is a red herring to make you think that someone else is getting that beast type. But if you think about it, there's no way they would stop the arc of Zeke and Eren right here in a, from a random titan from a random forest. No, 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 no. I think this Titan is either one of Levi's former comrades that just stuck by or is a random Titan that was ordered to follow Zeke just in case, which seems that plan paid off in dividends because now he's safe inside a Titan's tummy. Though we do have to address the visions of the little blonde headed girl we saw. Who in the hell was that? This is one of the most mysterious moments in the season. And then we're just coming off an episode where we got Zeke's backstory as well as Dr. Tom. Makes me wonder who this child is. Obviously, Dr. Tom's child was a son, and his mother, who murdered them, wasn't blonde, so it wasn't some child version of her. Really, I have no answers or any theories I'm comfortable with going with 100%, but some I thought of could be a daughter of some kind yet to be revealed. Another theory is that it could be someone Zeke met a long time ago. Maybe he was forced to sacrifice her and open up his mind, grounding him or something. Who knows? Either way, we'll probably find out in part two. I hope. <laughs> and speaking of hopes, Yelena's hopes finally came true. She's finally sitting across from Pixis during a meal. I, in one of my previous videos, theorized Yelena's intentions were to help Paradis, but of course I was very wrong about that theory. In a sense, I could still be right. But the thing about doing these second videos is that they're always fun to theorize and get wrong or right theories out of them. So with this scene, my biggest takeaway was how smart Pixis is. He was immediately able to figure out what the colored cloths meant. I said this in my first impressions video, but Pixis is somewhat underrated for how smart and sharp he is. I remember way back in the beginning of the series thinking that this guy was a badass in his own right. Like this guy, while totally cornered, still gives off this intimidating aura like the whole Survey Corps didn't just get dominated by the Jaegerists. He even gives Yelena a sick burn when he tells Yelena that she must have learned how to make enemies just like Marley did by using that wine. Though it is a really interesting way to go about things by turning down the help of the Survey Corps and Paradis to just betray them and take over. Obviously, there was a reason they did all of this and it seems it's working out great so far. But what happens when the Survey Corps bounces back? If there's always one constant in AOT, it is the fact that the Survey Corps almost always finds a way. Though at the moment, it 
may be a little difficult for them to break out, as they're kind of trapped in a cell and Armin isn't able to break them out as the Colossal Titan. The most notable aspect of this scene, to me, is John still caring about Mikasa and wanting to know how Eren hurt Mikasa. If you remember in Season 1, John had, and probably still does, I mean... <laughs> I wouldn't blame him, has some sort of crush or infatuation with Mikasa. So this was a nice callback to Jean's character. But something interesting about Jean here, even though Aaron has hurt Mikasa, he begs the question, does Aaron have a hidden motive? This is something I don't think we can overlook, because if this were the case, then Aaron would be waiting for the right moment to go along with Zeke's plan to bring out the power of the Founding Titan to do something other than euthanize the LED and people. I noted in an earlier episode that Aaron could have been trying to consume all of the Titans to stop the Titan power from being handed down, that he found a way to destroy the Titan ability. Well. Maybe instead of euthanizing the Eldian people, he figured out that with this power, he's going to stop the Titan ability from being passed down at the last minute, stopping Zeke's plan. Though at the same time, one would think that if that were the case, maybe they would have already begun to do that? Either way, it's just a theory I'm throwing out there. I didn't think too much about it in this context, so it could all be explained away. Then, oh the best sequence in this episode, and that is the sequences that involve Peak and Porco infiltrating the Shinganshina military base and nearly killing Eren in the process. Words cannot describe the goosebumps and chills when this scene went down. Like, oh my god, it was absolutely amazing. When Eren asks where the enemy is and Peak grabs Gabby's hand and points at Eren, oh, that, my friends, is an all-time moment. Not only that, but it involves such a new character like Peak, which hasn't been heavily involved with the series until this season. So to see her get this moment really solidifies the importance of Peak, and once again, that there are no weak links in the Titan Shifters. They are all formidable in their own ways. Not even Porco is considered a weak Titan Shifter here. He almost swallows Eren and claims the Founding Titan. He was only a, uh, a couple feet away, you could say. <laughs> but that would be really crazy though, thinking about that. How would AOT turn out if Porco actually got Aaron? But there is so much more to break down in this scene, specifically the Gabby involvement. Of course, I've been following Gabby's development quite a bit in this series, and this episode had a decent helping of Gabby, so I was excited to see what they did with her. Needless to say, absolutely beautiful. Peek tells Gabby that at the end of the day, no matter how hard she fights for the Eldians to give them a better name and reputation, it's going to all amount to nothing. The dream that she wants to achieve is one that's relatively impossible at least in the way that she would want it to happen. Of course, Peek was saying a lot of this to convince Gabby to follow her lead to full Eren, but I theorized that what Peek said was actually something she truly felt. It makes sense. Peek is an adult, she isn't some kid, and she knows the horrors of what being a Titan Shifter is. Coming from her, this is something we shouldn't shrug off as an attempt to lead someone, rather a sincere moment. In other words, a truth to convince someone of a lie. This is later backed up when Gabby, being shielded by Peek in a great scene, asks if she's meant all of this, and she says that she fights for the people beside her, not for Marley. This to me says that Peek indeed doesn't believe in those values the government force feeds them. Not saying Peek is the good guy or the bad guy here either, I'm not really making any of those kinds of statements, just simply that Peek is her own person with her own beliefs. In other words, once again, she ain't stupid. I hope Gabby will take this moment as one of the many straws it will take to break the camel's back. It's much needed. And once again, I am excited for Gabby's arc to come to a closure because she's such an amazingly well-written character with some amazing and memorable moments already. She obviously is starting to realize what she's done to Falco and how much her actions have affected his state of being. She's the reason for Falco swallowing that wine, and you just know that that fact has to weigh on her very hard. She's only just 12 years old. I do find it interesting that Gabby went from being this off the chains, high energy, crazy girl to now being constantly in a state of shock and self-reflection. The constant 
look of horror on her face at all times as an example of how she's processing a lot of her mistakes, actions, and God knows what else. A 12 year old isn't supposed to worry about these things, but she's already killed people and attempted to even more. Her saying to herself, it's all my fault in reference to Falco is a bit of that self-reflection creeping in, that bit of humanity that Gabby has been lacking for so long. It's a beautiful moment, a beautiful moment of development for a character like hers, and I'm so excited to follow her journey in part two. This episode was absolutely amazing and has one of the best scenes of Attack on Titan so far, and it was just, uh, just an experience. But this series so far has been one incredible ride, from the Battle of Trost, to the first Titan shout, to Erwin's death, and Eren's betrayal of the Survey Corps. It's been awesome, and I can't think enough Iseyama for making such an incredible series like this one. I would also say Attack on Titan Final Season Part 1 proved all those salty AOT fans wrong. From the stupid controversies of CGI, cut content, and, and animation, all the way to the death threats, harassment, and, and constant bombardment of hate for MAPPA adapting the rest of the series. This season has been just as good as every other season and all of the people who still say that MAPPA can't do it shouldn't be taken seriously. They can do it, and they did do it, and they will continue to. As a fan of this studio since 2017 with Inuyashiki, I've always known the studio could do great things. So thank you MAPPA for producing this anime's animation, and as well, thank you to the staff of the series who worked tirelessly to, while literally killing themselves probably, to produce this anime. The VAs and all of the companies who were outsourced to do the CGI and the other tasks to get this series out the door. Also, a thank you to you. The viewer watching this video right now. Well, I haven't been able to read the comments of my videos because of spoilers, I am working hard myself to read the manga of AOT to continue making content in the coming weeks so that when I am finished, I will finally be able to read all of your comments. Also, for you all viewing my content week to week, just before AOT aired, I was a channel with just about 10,000 subscribers working on ReZero content, getting maybe 500 to 1,000 views a video. After AOT finished airing, I am now at over 36,000 subscribers, and as I write this script initially, I'm not doing it right now as I'm recording it, but I'm kind of left in tears realizing this. While it was likely luck you found my channel through the YouTube algorithm, without you guys and that pesky hard to please algorithm, my life would be the same as it always was. But you've all literally quite changed my life. Through your viewership and excitement for my channel's content, I was able to do small things like get a new chair and desk to help with my back issues, get my own computer so that I can give the one I was using on loan back to my brother, and pay for my uh, <laughs> my anime subscription services so I could get high quality screenshots to use and <laughs> and footage to inevitably ruin with annoying filters and overlays. I do that for copyright reasons, of course. So thank you, truly. You guys have not only made my days so much better, but you've changed my life, made me a happier person all around. Now it's up to me to keep you guys engaged with my channel, to put in the hard work and create content you guys want to see, listen to your feedback and use your feedback to create a new version of me, of this channel. And let me tell you, I am up for that daunting challenge. I've been doing YouTube for nine years with little to no success. This time it's gonna be a little different. I've already decided to do weekly AOT videos starting on the 8th of April, but as we'll take feedback from the few comments I can read on my other videos and start to rewatch things like Dr. Stone, check out Demon Slayer once again, and all of the other feedback I've been lucky enough to receive since December. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all so much for watching my content, and I hope to continue to bring joy and entertainment to whatever method you choose to listen to me or watch my glorified slideshow presentations. But <laughs> I appreciate it. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.